Welcome everyone to the service today. Won't you join me as we read Psalm 100? Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations.
singing. That gets you all warmed up. <laughs> my name is Steve, my wife Sue at the piano, and our, our daughter Shelby uh, playing violin today. We welcome you here to Calvary Baptist Church. Let's take a moment to pray. Our Father, we have gathered in your name, our hearts overflowing with praise because you are the great God who has created and redeemed. And we joyfully anticipate the return of our Lord Jesus Christ when things on earth will then be as they are in heaven. May you be glorified as we sing your praise in his name. Amen. We want to reflect on the greatness of God. Hear this from Psalm 147. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praise unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praise upon the harp unto our God, who covereth the, the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. Let's sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, to take time to pray. God hears our prayer, and he always answers according to the perfection of his will. So as we go to prayer, let's be mindful of our government and pray for wisdom. Let's be mindful of one another and the trials, the difficulties that, that we may be facing, and know that God cares for us. And let's be mindful of those who work here at the home, that God would protect and would give them strength. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence and for your love. We thank you for the security we can have because Jesus Christ is the Savior and he makes us fit for heaven when we have trusted in him. Lord, we pray for our government. We ask that you would give wisdom to our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to our Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, 
to the MPs, to the judges in our courts, that they might lead us with righteousness, with justice, with wisdom. We pray especially for your help as they navigate the pandemic. And we ask that, that the infection rate and, and that the death rate would quickly subside now. And Lord, we pray that you would deliver us from this pestilence. We also pray for peace in our world. And please guide our government with its negotiations in that respect. We pray that you would also be with us, that we might have peace in our hearts. We pray, Father, for those that are part of this service who are suffering physically. We ask, Lord, that you would give grace that is sufficient to endure. And we pray for those who might be suffering financially or might be lonely or have some other trial. We all have our cares, Lord, but we cast these cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. Strengthen our faith and help us, Lord, to always have joy, and may that joy be our strength. Our Father, we pray for those who work at the Opal Home. We pray you would protect them, that you would give them strength. We pray that you would give them encouragement in their daily life. And we ask, Lord, that, that you would make the home a, a place that, that is, is safe, a, a place that, that is enriching for every resident and every worker. Our Father, thank you for loving us. We dedicate this service to you and ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. And now will you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Let's sing some more.
Our studies are taking us through the book of John. The Gospel of John is a very important book. It was written by one of the twelve apostles, and it tells us who Jesus is and why he has the right to tell us that we must believe in order to be saved. Last time we were in John chapter 3, and we covered that verse that many people have memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That verse is the gospel. It is the good news. All of us are born in sin, and we commit sin by choice. Our sin separates us from the holy God. But Jesus bridges the gap. He died on the cross to pay the penalty, to satisfy the justice against our sin. And because that justice has been satisfied, if we trust in him, then we have eternal life, and we will be with God forever. It's such good news. The only question is, have you believed in him? Now, the question could be raised, why believe in him? Why is it Jesus that we must believe in? The remaining verses in chapter 3 answer that question with three vital points. The first point is because he fulfills prophecy, a messenger came first. The second point is because he came from heaven, and the words he spoke proved that he is eternal and that he knows things that are beyond human comprehension. He came from heaven. And the third reason is that his words prove to be trustworthy. All those who put their faith in him found their lives transformed, found that they had peace and liberty and hope and joy. It's all because of Jesus. Let's have a look at the text. I'm reading from verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. Now John, as John the Baptist, also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. And so we've got John who is already baptizing there, and he's become very famous. People come from far and wide to be baptized by John as they repent of their sin and they seek the Savior, who at that point in time had not been fully revealed. So they, they were looking for the Savior to come, the Messiah. But now he has come, and Jesus has been declared. And he has come to that same portion of the Jordan River, and he too is baptizing. Now that, that could be cause for a bit of jealousy there. John is already established, and John has his followers and now Jesus is baptizing, and it, it kind of feels like there might be competition, but not from John's perspective. We continue reading from verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And so people were moving over to Jesus because they, they were more compelled by Jesus. And, and John is losing the crowd that once was surrounding him. The way John answers affirms to us that Jesus alone is the one we must trust in. And that is because Jesus alone is the Christ, the Son of the living God, our eternal Creator. So now we come to those three points that prove who Jesus is. And John is the one who makes these points. The first point, John was the messenger, the messenger who preceded and prophesied and testified, this is the Messiah. So we read from verse 27. John answered and said, a man, came, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, 
But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John understood his role. He was a messenger, a prophet, the last prophet before Messiah came. And he powerfully preached and testified that the one who comes after me is the Messiah that you have been waiting for for these hundreds of years. This in itself was a fulfillment of prophecy. Listen to this from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. God said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now that was spoken before the virgin birth, before the first coming of Jesus. And it details that there will be a messenger who turned out to be John the Baptist. And John the Baptist understood his role. He said, I'm like the best man at a wedding. I'm not the person who gets the spotlight, and I don't want to be the person. That is for the bridegroom. And just as the best man rejoices as a witness to these vows and this, this marriage that is created, John says, I am rejoicing that people are not giving attention to me. They are giving attention to the bridegroom. He is the one who matters. So that's the first reason, according to John, why Jesus is the one we must believe in. The second reason is where Jesus came from. Jesus always existed. He came from heaven and merely took on flesh with the virgin birth. His existence did not begin with the virgin birth. So we continue reading what John has to say here. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Jesus came from heaven. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. His knowledge of, of everything is beyond our comprehension. It's too wonderful for us. And so when Jesus came and he was speaking, he spoke with authority, for he, as God, knows all things. This is the second reason, according to John, that Jesus is the one we put our trust in, because Jesus is God. He came from above. And the third reason is that Jesus' word is trustworthy. All who believe in him are transformed and receive joy and receive peace, forgiveness, and eternal life. So from verse 33, He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. In other words, whoever takes Jesus at his word and believes in him can, can certify, can testify from their own experience that that word was true because it, it changed them. It gave them hope. It took away their fear and their guilt. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son, and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That final verse tells us why this is so important. When it comes right down to the end, there are only two kinds of people. There are those people who believe in Jesus because he is the Son of God and because he died on a cross for our sins and he rose again. There are those who believe in Jesus and are saved, forgiven, made a child of God. And there are those who do not believe in Jesus, who want to go it their own way or for whatever reason have chosen not to believe in him. And for them... The price Jesus paid at the cross does not apply because they don't want it to apply. And since it doesn't apply, 
they will suffer the punishment for their sin themselves. What a shameful thing. What, what an unnecessary thing. What a foolish thing. When Jesus has already satisfied God's justice, why would a person choose not to believe and to face the justice of God himself or herself? Well, friend, you don't have to be in that category. Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation? If you have, then you know that what I've just read from John chapter 3 is true. But if you haven't, today is your opportunity. I, I, I remember when I understood these things for the first time. And I prayed something like this. I prayed, Lord, I am sorry for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died for me and he paid for my sin. And I believe he's risen from the dead. He is the Savior. And right now, Lord, I put my trust in Jesus to forgive me, to cleanse me, to make me a child of God, to save me. I prayed that prayer when I was seven years old. And God saved me. And from that time forward, I have had no fear about what will happen after I die. I know I will be with God. Jesus has saved. Our Father, please give us this hope. Please be merciful that we might know Jesus as our Savior. We ask this in his name. Amen. I want to close with a benediction. This benediction comes from God's Word, from the book of Jude, and is assurance for those who have trusted in Christ that we will stand before God, accepted and approved. Here's the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever. Amen and amen. May God bless you and please know that we are praying for you.